The Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule has been proven time and time again. And the 80-20 rule is simply that 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your actions. So let's just apply that to a night for freedom. If I have a venue, you and I and Gavin or Owen are there, people were going to be, for the most part, happy. If that venue had to be changed to Central Park, if it had to be changed to Times Square, if it had to be changed. Right? If we're all on the now, subway in a row, <laughs> it's yeah. less optimal. Yeah. Yeah. People might not have loved it, but that if all we had had is a place for us to gather, then 80% of people are going to say, well, you know, you pulled it off. Son of a gun. You know, it's great. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to seek out that other 20%. The, the other, but so what happens with people is they go, well, I can't pull off a hundred percent of it. Where am I going to put the tables? Where are they going to put the chairs? I didn't even think about any of that, to be honest. It didn't even occur to me that there would be tables and there'd be tablecloths and they would be set up. And then as it turns out, the way we did our podcast, we were all facing the crowd instead of each other. So in the postmortem, yeah, what we need to improve more is an hour more of programming before the party. A more kind of Reuben Report-esque setup where we're looking at each other talking rather than sitting like this. So, yeah, we are going to take it to another level. And if you want to criticize yourself, but fundamentally you have to say, what is it that's going to get me the 80%? So, for example, I always say watch the Joe Rogan podcast, even though Joe is – I don't know what's happened to him lately. But number one, Joe Rogan podcast. He and Red Band are sitting in front of a laptop. And there's like these like flowers in the air. It's just like it looks dumb, to be honest, you know. And now he has one of the top podcasts in the world. But why? Because he did the podcast. Your early videos are you in a Bluetooth, you know, in your car, driving around the Bluetooth. Now you have one of the biggest philosophy pod podcasts in the world. Why? Because well, you did the podcast. Just keep doing you didn't it. Say, well, yeah, it could have been better. And, you know, the, my pacing was a little off. And, you know, what about this? And that's what stops people. They're like, well, the lighting isn't perfect and I need 15. No, you don't. You need to do a podcast. You need to do a blog. That's going to bring you 80% results. And then as you keep plugging along, then you say, okay, like, yeah, lighting does matter. So even me, I went from this Periscope iPhone. Great. I just, that's what I did. I didn't always look good and the lighting was bad. Great. Now I have a pro professional home studio. Next year, I'll have something else, right? So you do want to make those gains, but fundamentally you have to say, what is something that I can do? that will yield maximum results. And for most people, quite frankly, it's just get off the couch. <laughs> or, you know, Jordan Peterson would say, clean your room, right? And Because what happens is as you do that, then you start improving. You go, oh, yeah, so I did my first podcast. I, I watched it. And, you know, Shauna says I talk with my hands too much. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Well, well how about you do the podcast first? So how about you do the videos first? So. Yeah, that just, just is, an object that is in motion tends to stay in motion and an object that is at rest tends to stay at rest. And this perfectionism, you know, the idea that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, there's something that really struck me when I was younger. I think it was some band, I think Huey Lewis in the News or something like that, which kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. And when you look into most bands, what you do is you look back and you see, okay, well, they spent 10 years playing pubs. You know, like uh, uh, Katy Perry, you know, started writing songs when she was like nine years old. And uh, if you look at like In Excess, the band, they ended up, uh, you know, they were playing the backwater bars in the outback in Australia for like years and years and years. And that, when people kind of erupt into your consciousness, it looks like they've just appeared out of nowhere. Like they just teleported into fame and competence, but they didn't. And recognizing that there's just, there's a long grind uh, in order to, to get sudden quote, sudden success. Uh, people want, of course, a sudden success because when you're on the receiving end, it looks like they just teleported in. But there's a lot of grind and a long way to go to get there. And, you know, that journey of a thousand miles, just start walking, just start doing something. Find out what you like, find out what the audience responds to, find out what you're passionate about and willing to risk for it. Because if you're not willing to risk, you can't possibly succeed. And that slow and steady wins the race aspect. I think people look at that and say, well, that's a hell of a long way to go. And it's like, well, sure, which is why you should start walking right now. Well, it, so there's three points to that. One is that your idea of what is great, well, guess what? Other people have their own opinion, right? So first of all, if you think, well, I can't do it because... I'm not good enough. Well, you might be, 
right, or you actually might be wrong. Some of the stuff that I've done that I thought was bad, the market said we love it and they rewarded that. And then two is what you talked about, the 10-year overnight success. Oh, where'd that guy come from? Out of nowhere. No, he didn't. He was 10 years in obscurity. I was an obscure blogger since I was like 25. I didn't really blow up till I was probably like 35, 36, okay? And then, of course, the 10,000 rule. How are you going to get into your 10,000 hours of practice if you're not doing it? And what we have to do is we have to, to practice in public. And then I guess finally to touch on the point where people see what we have. So here's I, I put it this way. I go, you don't want to do what I do. You want to have what I have. And here's what I mean. People go, Mike, how can I do what you do? Um, you mean pick up a phone and talk and do it? Uh, you pick up a phone and you're talking to it. And to have a blog, yeah, you buy a domain for $10, install WordPress, and you just write thoughts. So you don't want to do that. You want to have what I have, but what people don't understand is what you and I have, oh, it seems cool, oh, we have an audience. Well, yeah, but it isn't cool when people harass your family. The death threats aren't cool. The having to have home security installed isn't cool. The having to have a security guy come around. You know, so if you the, the rumors and lies that people spread about you and then how that gets to your family and then your family starts asking your wife questions. So if people were just thrust into what you and I have, they would they would actually be crushed because you wouldn't even know how to handle it. But when you level up, so actually the worst thing that can happen is if you do have that instant super startup because then suddenly you're like, well, wait a minute, how do I deal with vultures? How do I deal with parasites? How do I deal with the media? Lot? You don't even know, but you and I, we've leveled up progressively. So now it's just like, oh, okay, so this is just a different way of dealing with the problem that I've dealt with on a smaller scale. So it's actually better to level up progressively over 10 years. Yeah, I mean, I remember way back in the day, one of my early videos, there was a guy uh, I knew who was uh, talking to me and said, yeah, but your video, man, it did like 500 views. That's really sad. And now you could look at that and say, well, compared to this person or that person, that's not very much. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. So if I went to go and give a speech and there were 500 people in the audience, would you consider that a failure? And he's like, well, no, that, that would be pretty good. And it's like, so that's my metric. You know, I'm reaching 500 people without even having to travel. And, and there you build up from there. You know, you don't get to uh, 100 million plus views and downloads, uh, you know, that, that way. You just keep uh, uh, focusing and, and just get stuff done. That is really, really the important thing. You know, it's that old saying that says, uh, if you want something done, give it to the busy guy. Because people who are in motion are going to get things done. You generate excitement. You generate um, enthusiasm and you generate momentum and people want to join the winning team. And, and so for me, there is, for, for the most part, a kind of desert you have to cross. And the desert is you're putting out a huge amount of effort and you're not getting much in terms of feedback. You're not getting much in terms of return. Now, you'll have a few dedicated people early on. Hold on to those people. The people who love what you do from the beginning, they're the way, they're the water bottles, in a sense, you drink to get across the desert to more general popularity. But if you have a goal in you that is not based on vanity, if you have a goal in you that's based on making the world a better place, you don't have the option to, to sag and to stop because you have a goal to make the world a better place. If you're like a doctor and you have a pill that can cure some deadly disease and you've got a giant sack full of them, well, you could sit there and say, my legs are tired. It's like, yeah, but I'm doing something really, really important. And that's what powers your legs. And I think a lot of time people procrastinate because they want to make it about themselves. They want to make it about their va vanity. Like in, in England, the kids, uh, they did a survey. And they said, and what's the number one thing that the kids want? To be famous. Well, for what? For, for what purpose? Well, for vanity, for money. If you make it about you, you'll almost never have the locomotion to sustain the cross across the des desert of obscurity to sort of the lush oasis of having an effect. And if you make it about you, you'll never have the willpower to continue. And not only that, but those who want fame don't realize that if you want to be loved, then that means hate is going to get to you. See, this is another thing a lot of people don't understand is that Compliments for me are nice. I like to get compliments. But even when I get a bunch of them and, you know, you'll read them, you know, what I'm a human being. I'll go read all the five-star reviews about Gorilla Minds on Amazon and feel good about myself. But then I go, well, wait a minute. If you let compliments define who you are and how you feel about yourself, then when the hate comes in, then the hate is going to have more impact than it would. Mm. So a, a lot of that has to come to to transcend your own ego because the bigger your ego, the more the mob can control you. 
-hmm. You have to fundamentally have a philosophical belief system and believe that, look, I, what I'm doing is right. And what I'm doing is making the world a better place. So I know a lot of people are going to love that. A lot of people are going to hate that. But I have to stay the course and realize that I'm trying to move the world and move people into the right direction. And doing that, you're going to get love. Don't let the love inflate your ego too much. You're going to get hate. Don't let the hate bring you down. You have to stay grounded. So that's even sort of one of my mantras is that I just try to stay grounded. I don't ever try to let the love inflate me too much. And I don't ever, I don't ever let the hate bring me down too much. Yeah, I mean, when I, I mean, it was quite a love bomb at, at um, A Night for Freedom in New York. You know, you got hundreds of people saying, you know, you changed my life. I'm a better person. My kids are being raised well. I got married. I had kids because of the principles I learned through your show and so on. It's wonderful. Now, I mean, I could sit there and say, well, that makes me a great person. And I don't really experience it that way at all, Mike. The way that I'm experiencing it, the way I experience it is they have gained a respect for philosophy, for rational thinking, for clarity, for honesty. And so if the show has helped create that sort of North Star for them to guide their lives by, fantastic. Fant it's not about me. The last thing I'd want is for people to sort of sit there and say, well, I'm going to ask Steph, what would Steph, what would Steph tell me to do? It's like the whole point is to empower people to make decisions for themselves. You don't invent the scientific method. So everyone runs to you and asks you what's true or false. But so they have a methodology for themselves to figure out what is right or wrong. But the hatred stuff is really important. And I think you get even more than I do, Mike. And, and that's a big question because uh, it does come as a surprise for a lot of people. Because when you start out, you're surrounded by people who support you. And then you get out into a wider arena. And, you know, they just people call in this crazy rage of airstrikes down upon uh, public figures, particularly those involved in this kind of empowering work. The way that I work with it is to recognize that I am a proxy for what they dislike of themselves, that it's really not about me. It's, it, I mean, I don't, they don't even know me. I'm just some guy. I'm a bunch of pixels on the screen. I'm a, a guy doing uh, what he thinks is the most important thing to do um, on his own integrity. It doesn't have anything to do to me. They, they can't possibly hate me because they don't really know me. How is it that teaching people to think critically and overcome inner inhibitions to live a powerful life, what, is, what makes that so terrible for people? Well, a human nature, I call it the law of reflection is best understood in terms of you see a guy's in a Ferrari and somebody goes, oh, that's a little, you know, what car, right? He must have a small something. He's compensating for that. And you go, I don't know, maybe he just likes cars. Maybe he worked his whole life and he bought a used Ferrari or maybe that was really what matters to him. But the idea is if, if you see an image of a person, you feel insecure about it. So you want to, oh, no, I don't want to admit why I feel insecure. Maybe I don't feel like I could buy, ever buy a car like that. So with you... If you're telling people, hey, you know, be live human rationality, you're showing courage. People, then they see fear back. They're like, well, he's not afraid. Why am I afraid? Me, I think the reason they hate me, and people think I'm crazy, but, you know, you tell me what you think. I think people hate me because everybody knows I talk a little funny, myself included. And you know what I do every day? I get up and I talk. And they go, well, wait a minute. How dare he? How dare he do podcasts and videos? How dare he get up and not let this bother him? Well, what they're really saying is, well, he's doing something I believe that I should be able to do. He's showing great courage every time he gets up and talks. I feel like a coward. Well, rather than say, well, why do I feel like a coward? And how can I show more courage? I'm going to lash out on him for making me feel that way. Mm. No, that's very interesting because everybody has a particular kind of physical flaw where they can look in the mirror and say, well, here's why I can't do X. You know, I got an overbought. I'm bald. I'm, bo I'm old rather than the demographic relative to a lot of people. And, you know, I get a lot of bald jokes and so on. How can you handle it? It's like, first of all, it's fantastic because I could just get up and do a video. I mean, there's not a lot of styling going on here. Uh, I know that you have a, the, the, what do you use a towel or something sometimes, a, a towel and some coconut juice or something. But um, people, they stop themselves because of perceived physical flaws. I mean, the funny thing is, I've never actually heard uh, what people talk about with regards to your voice. I'm really focusing on the content of what you're saying. I could care less. It doesn't matter. But if you have a physical flaw, which everyone does, of course, and, and everyone thinks there's some level wherein your physical flaws won't matter, and that's bullshit. You know, I get a pimple, who cares? But if you're a face model and you get a pimple, well, you're doomed, right? Or, or if you get to be over 28 or whatever it is, right? So uh, everybody has a level of physical perfection that uh, is going to elude them based upon where they are. And when you have 
just publicly saying, well, I don't care if I speak funny. I don't care if I'm bald. I don't care if I'm older than the usual demographic. I don't care. I don't care at all. I don't care if I don't have, uh, you know, an entire boatload of credentials behind me to allow, because that actually makes me work harder. You know, the, the stuff makes me work harder. The fact that I don't have a set makes me work harder to be more animated, to, to have better analogies and metaphors and so on. And so if you don't let yourself be stopped by little things that are outside of your control to a large degree and fundamentally unimportant, then I think that does challenge people who use that excuse of imperfection to avoid being in motion. See, and, and that's the hate. The hate is like, who do you think you are, right? Well, what they're really saying is I feel smaller. Another kind of silly example is when I was out, you know, dating or whatever, I would go inside and I'd wear aviator glasses with reflective lenses. And I would have quite attractive girls say, really? I can't believe you're doing that. And I was like, why are you getting so mad, right? <laughs> well, because sociologically they were thinking well he must think that he's better than everyone else because the rules say you can't wear aviator sunglasses i'd wear cowboy hat i would just do something that i would stand out in a ridiculous manner and it does work because they would say well who do you think you are to sell to challenge our mores our norms because people believe that whatever their ideas are are their ideas well you're supposed to walk talk act look speak behave in a certain way, well, because they were designed by society to do that. So they're called, I don't know if you've ever read his book, Howard Bloom, The Global Brain. He calls them conformity enforcers. Mm. So the idea is that if you're a nonconformist, which you clearly are, if you're a nonconformist like I clearly am, you're going to trigger, it's almost like a biological hive mind process where the conformity enforcers are going to come in and say, how dare you? How dare you not conform? How dare you think you can teach philosophy if you're not at Harvard? But then when you're Jordan Peterson and you taught psychology at Harvard, they go, he's a YouTube star. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, it's like, well, wait a minute here. You're saying Molyneux is in a PhD at Harvard, so he can't talk philosophy. But Jordan Peterson is a PhD or whatever, and he taught at Harvard, but he's just a YouTube guy, right? So they're not even honest in their critique. If you tell people, people go, how do I change my life? right? Like as in my mindset work, I'm like, well, you don't change your life. You get off the couch, you go to the gym. Well, what do I do at the gym? I want to bench press 500 pounds. You don't go to the gym and bench press 500 pounds. Just go to the gym and walk around. And people think that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I go, when's the last time you've been to the gym? Well, you know, I used to go 10 years ago. I go, well, how about, because, because I know that if you just go to the gym and walk around, eventually you're going to be like, well, what's this thing? Or what's that thing? And then the rest will fall into place. So you don't change your life, get off the couch. Or with Jordan Peterson, like people go, how to, just clean your room, right? Just the idea that once you clean your room, then you're going to say, oh, my room's clean. I'm a little bit more organized. Well, maybe I should decorate a little bit better. Or maybe I should do this. It's those habits you develop in the process. But unfortunately, people don't believe that gradual improvement is possible. I think it's the, that sort of one central devil that's got his tentacles wrapped around the neck of potential. Uh, it would be procrastination. And it's the people, like everyone knows that deep down you have something to offer the world. It may not be spectacular. It may not be earth shaking, but so what? Everyone has something to offer the world. And I do believe that we have a kind of obligation to bring our talents to bear on making the world a better place for the basic reason that we've inherited the freedom to do so by people who made that striving themselves. Procrastination, you know you got something to do, you know you got something that you can offer, but it's easier to play a video game or to stare at the television or whatever it is. Do you have that temptation? Do you know people who you've helped overcome? And what's the best way to just get that spur into the ass of people? Oh, of course, I'm a naturally extremely lazy person, <laughs> which that isn't self-effacing. It's actually true. I'm a naturally, naturally lazy person, so I have to overcome procrastination pretty much every day in my life. Now, as you do create a positive feedback loop where people are like, oh, come on, Mike, do a video, you know, you, then you don't want to let people down and like, okay, okay, you know, I, was, I don't want to do a video today, but sure. So once you're in the feedback loop, it changes. But what, what I tell people is the great, greatest thing I ever read, I wish I'd come up with, was that hell is what happens when you're on your deathbed and you meet the person you could have become. Mm. And one day, one day people are going to look back and you're going to wonder, well, maybe I could have done something. And when that happens, it's going to be too late. Mm -hmm. There's no time like today. The person you're going to become isn't going to be brought into being unless you start working on that person today. And maybe 
maybe one day you'll be, be confronted with what you could have become. Procrastination doesn't necessarily have to do with massive ambition in the world. It can simply be, I want to improve my relationships. I want to be more present. I want to be more honest. I want to be who I am and not just a conforming mirror to other people's expectations, to actually self-actualize, to be who you are and vocal about what you think and with the willingness to correct and, and be corrected. And working on your relationships, you know, relationships can be an incredible boost. They can also be an incredible limitation if you're around people fundamentally opposed to who you are and you're not aware of it. And so the procrastination doesn't have necessarily something to do with, you know, building some new philosophical system or holding a knife for freedom. It can be just, I'm sick and tired of not being honest in my relationships. And that dishonesty, that self erasure is fundamentally required by the expansion of the powers that be of control over you. If you're not yourself, what do they care uh, if uh, they take away your rights? If you have nothing original to say, what do you care if there's no freedom of speech? If all you're gonna do is conform, what do you care about voluntary association or freedom of association? So become who you are, and become honest and, and speak the truth about what you believe, that's the foundation for actually valuing the freedoms that our ancestors fought so hard to give us. Yeah, the revolution starts with you. Any procrastination starts with you. Don't change the world, change yourself. Don't worry about, if you can't change yourself, for example, and this, by the way, is why I have much more tolerance of people within their own, you know, I have a lot, large degree of um, tolerance for weird people, and primarily because I know how hard it is to change myself. The idea that I'm going to change every person that I ever meet is to me insurmountable. The idea that I'm going to completely change the world is, strikes me as odd. And yet here you and I are, we have been changing the world, but that all started 10, 15, 20 years ago when we first looked in the mirror and decided to change ourselves. It's a funny thing too. Yeah, there's an old, I mean, it's a very common belief, or at least I wish it were more common, that if you can't manage your own feelings, you end up having to control other people. Like if you can't manage your own uh, sense of insecurity, like let's say you're jealous, right? You have a tendency towards jealousy and you're in a relationship. If you can't find a way to manage and rationalize and deal with your own paranoias about being jealous, let's assume that your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend is not cheating, then you end up having to control your partner's behavior. Oh, you can't go out to this place. You can't go out with this person because you can't manage your own feelings. You end up controlling other people. But the amazing thing for me, when I really began to start working on changing myself, Mike, was the humility when it, the humility it gives you about institutions' capacity to change the world. That nothing ends up with a greater skepticism towards central planning and, and government control of this, that, and the other. When you start to change yourself and you realize how difficult it is, the idea that some centralized institution can wave a magic wand of bureaucracy and change the world for the better completely evaporates from your mind, which is why I think people who pursue self-knowledge end up being skeptical of these big giant government institutions and social engineering monoliths. Character is destiny. Your actions become your habits and your habits become your character. Fighters fight, weak people quit, and strong people survive and thrive. Even if, a, even if a challenge you set is arbitrary, meet the challenge because small victories like small surrenders add up. And this, you know, I mean, as a parent, right, I mean, you'll, you'll get into this when, when Syra gets older. Commitments matter. You know, if my daughter commits to something, it's like, I, you know, I'm going to view that as physics, you know, unless you get, you know, something unforeseen happens that's beyond our control. If you commit to this, that's important. You know, like I, um, I had some people at the house today, it took a little while to settle things up. I was a few minutes late for, and I was like, I'm sorry, you know, like I was, I didn't be here at one and, uh, you know, these little things matter. And again, it's the don't sweat the small stuff, but recognize that if you have a life where you're only making large commitments, it will be impossible because large commitments flow out of small commitments. You know, like we, I was, uh, came out to California to work with you on, 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 um, hoaxed. And I had to actually be at the airport on time. <laughs> you know, like this big commitments, they come out. I had to set my alarm. I had to drive to the airport. I had to have everything I needed. To, like all these little small things end up with the big things. And a lot of people focus on the very big commitments without uh, having the details in place necessary to achieve those big commitments. Exactly. And we, we could all, you know, Warren Buffett actually, despite his politics, has a lot of this kind of homespun wisdom, which is that the how does he say it? The, the threads of habit aren't felt until they become the chains of habit. The idea that you're, when you're younger and you're doing all these little things, you don't realize that this is becoming who you are. And if you just lie to people and you're in the habit of lying to get out of something, next thing you know, you're 50 years old and you can't tell the truth to people. Mm -hmm. And now you say, well, I don't want to be a liar. I want to be a more honest person. Or I want to be a more punctual person. 
Well, they're, they're just little threads that you feel and that those, those threads do become chains and it's like that for everything. And the answer to that is just being aware of your habits, right? So for me, for me, and this kind of relates to the whole think big, start small. The reason I'm kind of where I am now is I just said, I'm going to habitually do something on the internet <laughs> years ago, maybe a blog post, maybe a podcast. I don't know. But every day, seven days a week, I'm going to do something on the internet. And then as you do these somethings, you become better at it and you become more fluent and you recognize more opportunities. You're, you level up and level up and level up. And then eventually you're doing very, very big things because good, good traits become character, right? So same thing as, you know, it's amazing. So much of these um, habits of life, you can see them everywhere. Authors will say, you know, Stephen King, he'll go, people ask me, how can I write a book? And he said, well, do you write every day? Well, I don't know. Do you want, well, write every day for an hour. Maybe something comes out, maybe it doesn't. But if you do write every day, eventually you will. And you just finished the book, so you know that as well as anybody. You have this conception of a book in your head which seems sort of daunting and abstract. And how do you do it? And then you go, well, I'm just going to write 500 words about whatever I feel like writing about. Maybe I'll use it. Maybe I won't. You do that every day. After a year or two, you have a book. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, and, and just <laughs> freaking work. I mean, there's, there's no substitute for hard work. There's no magic. Like I was uh, just talking with my producer this morning, like yesterday, I did uh, some research in the morning, did a long show with Tom Woods about economic misconceptions, and then uh, talked with the researcher about the Manson presentation, did the Manson presentation, and then did a three and a half hour call-in show. Now, that's a little bit more than, than usual, but those are the kind of days you just have to have sometimes. It's that 10,000 hour thing. It's the Beatles playing in Hamburg for two years, uh, seven hours a day. You just have to work. There's no no substitute for putting the grind in. Uh, it really pays off. It's like going to the gym. You just, you have to go, you have to do it. Yeah. I, uh, people always go, Oh, you know, especially when I was like really super jacked, people always were like, that's why I'm glad I'm not like Jack. Like I used to be because people don't ask me for training routines because it's just like a waste <laughs> of my time. Right. How do I get super jacked? Like, well, how many times do you go to the gym this week? Well, you know, I've been busy and it got worse. <laughs> it's like, okay, you're wasting my time. Just right. get, get away from me. But then I told the person who was actually serious, I go, look, what I'm about to tell you is going to sound um, dumb and you're not going to believe me, but trust me. And he goes, what? I go, just go to the gym for an hour. Just walk around. What do I do? Just walk around, stretch, do whatever you feel like doing. And the person thought I was insane. And I go, no. And I go, what's going to happen is don't get on your cell phone, put in airplane mode. If you walk around, nature abhors a vacuum. You're going to be like, God, I'm just bored doing nothing in the gym. And then you're going to say, okay, well, I'm bored doing nothing in the gym. Therefore, I should do something. And then you're going to do something. And then you're going to do another something. And the next thing you know, eight weeks later, 12 weeks later, you're now just a regular kind of gym guy. Because it's that habit of just going there. Because there are times I go to the gym and I'll, I don't do anything. I just stretch. And I just, I'm there for half an hour. I'm like, well, I went. I'm not, you know. 29 anymore where I just go in and grind away for an hour and a half. It's cool. But I just go in to get myself in the habit. Same thing. I walk every day. I might walk for a mile. I might walk, walk for 10 miles, but just an idea of, of getting out and kind of doing something. Seek small victories. Comparison is suicide, as Ralph Waldo Emerson told us in Self-Reliance. Your victories are yours, and it doesn't matter how they size up with anyone else's. Plus, I've met the obscenely rich and famous. For the most part, they are bland people who struck it big one time, which isn't hating on them, but they are petty and nasty like everyone else. And yeah, you look at the top of Everest and you say, well, I can never get up there. And it's like, but well, you don't look at the top of Everest. You look 10 feet up from where you are and you get there. And that's how everyone gets to the top of Everest is 10 feet at a time. It's the old cliche that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. If all you do is focus on your distance from your ultimate goals, it's going to be disheartening and give yourself something you can achieve every day. Otherwise, how do you know if your day has been worth it? Exactly. Because a lot of people fail to take action because they're, they feel like they're not consequential. But I'm not, this thing I'm doing is just a small business. I'm, well, yeah, sure. I remember I, I, I tell this story over and over and over again until people get bored. As I go, the biggest month for me ever was, was when I made $13 off a website. <laughs> that sounds, because I knew I could now. 
And I know that if I can make 13, I can do 1300 and I can do 13. I can do, I, I just knew that like, okay, I, I figured out how to do it. Now I just have to figure out how to scale that and how to make it bigger. And a lot of people would say, well, if you only made $13 a month off a website, why would you feel good about that? Right? Because there are all these people doing all these other things. And I go, well, I felt good about it because I never knew how to do it. Well, and does, somehow, does anybody able- understand the term proof of concept anymore? Right. Yeah, you know, they don't. We, we can't possibly manufacture every car for how much it took us to make the first one. It's like, that. that's not the point. That's not how it works. You you put a huge amount of effort to make that first sale and then you scale it from there. But once you've made that first sale, once you've made that first $13, you've crossed the Rubicon. Now it's just a matter of time and effort. Exactly. And, and that's another kind of way too. people, even friends and family will try to sabotage you. If you're excited about it, they'll be like, well, I mean, that's not that really that big of a deal. And no, you want people who are th- saying, wow, that's amazing. That's exciting. Imagine what you can kind of do from here. And that, and that, again, goes back to the importance of community and keeping the right people. In. My very first donation, $5. $5. I wish I could have printed it out and framed it, but it was, uh, and, and that was like, wow, are you kidding me? So from here. Okay, 14, play the odds unless you have an edge. I was having a little trouble with this one. You could break it down. You say, this goes for investing in the stock market, dating, and living generally. Certain rules, you know, don't day trade, but instead dollar cost average into the market. I got that. Don't quit your job to follow your passion are going to lead you to the best outcome frequently enough that it's folly to break those rules. Now, the don't quit your job to follow your passion, um, well, I guess you were a lawyer, I was an entrepreneur, and so on. There is, I mean, it, if you've got some place to go, then go, right? I mean, don't just say, oh, I made five bucks and then quit your job because you need to figure out how sustainable and, and how um, scalable the certain is. But help me sort of understand what this means for, uh, for people's lives. Right. A great example is people go, well, sir, if you have a daughter, what would you tell your daughter? Here's exactly what I will tell my daughter. You will probably be happier if you play a more supportive role in a respectful but sort of alpha male and have a family, probably almost certainly. But if you want to go be the big career woman, that's great too. Just know that the probabilities are not on your side. So if, if you find a rule that works, generally you want to say that that's the rule that's going to work. The same thing too with start a business. We always watch these big specials and they go, this man came up with this invention and he was hopeless, and then he double mortgaged his house and maxed out his credit cards, and then now he's worth $100 million. Well, they don't show you the nine guys who did that, and they're now bankrupt. Right. Right? So the, This guy the world, won the lottery. Yeah, Everyone exactly. should play the lottery. It's like, well. Right. So I didn't just quit and say I'm going to be a professional blogger, or entertainer, or journalist. I worked, and then I, half an hour a day, I would build up my websites. I would learn how do you do a WordPress site, how do you do a blog, how do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do that? But I just work. I didn't say, oh, this is what I really want to do. And then once I did make that $13 and then I had the infrastructure built, I said, oh, you know, I know how to do it now. I'm going to make a ton of money off of this internet stuff. And then I went there. But most people go, oh, I'm at work and I feel unfulfilled. Yeah, it's because it's a job. People are paying you to do the job because they can make a profit off of you, right? So, yes, you are underpaid. You are undervalued. That's the whole point of somebody giving you a job is because they want to reap as much of a financial benefit as they can off your labor. That's just the nature of the beast. So no, don't quit your job. Work on it and then go work on a, a side thing uh, as you move along. And then once that side thing becomes viable, then you transition to that. So th- there are so many, so many views like that. For example, um, most men will be happier if they get married a little bit later in life. Just the reality. Getting married at 25, you're not in your peak as a man. As a man, you peak in your late 20s, early 30s. So why not wait until you're at your peak value before you make that big commitment, right? But then people, but I'm in love, and this is a unique thing. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm not going to argue with people who think they're in love. But it, it just shows the probabilities are you're almost certainly going to be better off if you do wait until you're, say, in your early 30s to get married, you'll probably be, have a better relationship, you'll have a better companion. It, the, the odds will be on your side. So people have to make their own choices in life, but you gotta realize, you have to ask yourself, what is it about me that is special that I'm gonna go against this rule that is highly effective and that is most likely gonna lead to a good outcome? You might have a good justification, but just think that one through. 
make one big move a year. So this is something, your reincarnation of ambition is something that's quite dizzying to, to watch. So you say, in 2017, I decided to become a journalist. In 2016, I moved into films. In 2015, I published my first book. Now, a lot of people in 2015 would say, woohoo, book worked, I'm gonna be a writer. Uh, but you keep moving to uh, new areas. And what is the thought process behind that? The thought process is that whenever you level up, level up, because life is going to level you down eventually. Um, <laughs> down six feet, I think. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you, you know, you always, like you said, you don't want to, you don't want to lose your optimism. You do want to remain optimistic, but you also want to remain realistic is people go, Sir, when are you going to slow down? And I go, oh, trust me, this life always has something planned for you. Let's worry about that when life kind of comes at you. So you always want to rise highest level that you possibly can you always want to play the, the game in the major leagues as much as you can and why well because you, one day you're going to reflect on your life and think wow we did all these things and you can always go back to chill mode right that's the way because that's what people go why are you doing this journalism stuff instead of the mindset and i say well because i will never probably be able to do this again this for me was a once in a decade opportunity where sure, I'm going to go report from the White House. I'm going to break these big stories where I'm just at like a unique historical time. And if I want to go back and do mindset stuff, I can go do that in another year or two. So uh, people, you got to realize life is a very special event. You're not any younger. You're not going to have any more energy the next day when a big opportunity arises, take it. If a big opportunity isn't arising, then make it. So, so here's one that I'll try and keep the rant short, but uh, it does frustrate me no end when people get down on themselves because I view it as a fundamentally selfish thing. I, like to self-attack is fundamentally selfish because you're avoiding your fears by attacking yourself rather than providing value to the world. And generally, self-attack is an invitation to a pity party which drags people in to try and prop up your self-loathing or your despair or your lack of trust in yourself and so on. And it tends to be a very selfish action. It's a demand for attention. It's a demand for resources which almost never seem to get paid back and it's hard for people to see just how that so when in your stop rejecting yourself this is number 21 you say people in my coaching talks people give me 10 reasons why they can't do something all of those reasons are completely made up give the world the opportunity to reject you and that i think is really uh, important to get people out of this self-doubt or the idea that the self-doubt is something that needs to be fixed by other people in particular yeah I've told people, I use the example, I've done things that I thought for sure were going to hit, they didn't. I've done things that I didn't think would ever hit, and they did. And there's this great thing, especially that we right-wing thinkers understand, is there is this great thing, this invisible hand. There is this market, and this market are other people. So you don't know what is good until you, you test it with the market, you test your ideas with the market, and then you're going to get the pushback from the market. So... I always ask people, I go, why do you think you know so much? You must be omnipotent. <laughs> if you know that you can't do this because it's a surefire way you're going to fail, I wish I had your level of omnipotence because even today I'm trying new things and getting pushed back from the market and accepted or rejected from the market. That process is never going to go away. Oh, the... <laughs> this is the greatest thing I've ever done. People are going to love this. And it's like this massive yawn of indifference. And it's like, eh, I'll just, I'll just toss off this little video. You know, I got a few minutes and it's like, woohoo. And it's like, oh, I just, I give up. And this is what they say in Hollywood. Uh, other than bend over, they say nobody knows what makes a successful movie. Otherwise, every movie would be that way. All right. Affirmation time. I guess we're going to dip past the smooth, Stuart Smalley world in people's minds. You say, every day say to yourself, my heart is filled with love and overwhelming abundance from the universe. And that is this fear of abundance, this fear of success. I don't know if that's people's internalized fear because you'd only have fear of something that you want but thought you, you couldn't get. Like I'm not afraid of going on a ballet audition because I'm not going to be a ballet dancer and I, I, never, I don't care, so I don't want it. So if you feel anxiety about a goal, it's, it's how you know you want it. Like if there's some girl you really, really want to date, then you're going to feel nervous asking her out because no is going to be painful. So I don't know this, this fear of abundance, this fear of success, whether it comes from people internally or whether it's other people's fear, like we don't want you to succeed because that raises the goals for us or that raises the game for us. But this fear of abundance, this fear of success is really challenging. And it's one of the great stoppers in human potential and human flourishing in the modern world. 
Yeah, because we fear that we might lose it if we have it. That's why this nihilism that we live under, people are like, oh, I'm above it all. I'm just going to go do nothing with my life because who cares? Caring is slavery and everything else. No, that's just their recognition that they do want more out of life, but they're afraid that they might not get it or they might not get everything they want. But again, this is the whole paradoxical reasoning that you have to become comfortable with is if you chase what you want, you're going to be happy even if you don't get it. People go, that can't be possible. How could that possibly be true? Well, because you're going to get something else, right? Like you're, you're going to get something, even if it's not that specific thing. And then, of course, what you realize is when you get older, I don't think, oh, man, I didn't have everything I wanted at 30. You forget all the things you never had. Because once you do eventually make it, even though there, that, that, there's no like, end point of making it, when you do become, you know, whether you're 70 years old, I would say George R. R. Martin, look at that guy. He was a middling, no successful author for whatever. He's 65. Game of Thrones finally hits it big. I bet you he's not thinking about crying about when he was 50 and his failures at 50. He's thinking, oh, man, I made it. You know, I'm 65 now. This is great. I'm going to go. And, of course, that's why fans aren't getting these books because he's been having so much fun in his life that he doesn't want doesn't to finish them. And so that's what people realize is once you do start searching for what you want and striving for it, even if you don't get that specific thing, you will get something amazing and it'll make it all worthwhile. 